The family in kilt making dates back pre-World War II. So we're talking about my grandma Yetta and her father. Her father was an immigrant, Russia, Ukraine, sort of border areas. He was a cutter and presser in a kilt tailoring company on Princess Street called Forsyth's. And my grandmother joined him as an apprentice age 16, so we're probably talking, it's 1930s. And she learned kilt making. World War II hit and she was shipped off to Peterhead up north to a secret air base and my grandfather from London was put there too as an engineer. She packed um, parachutes and my grandfather worked on secret airplanes and missions and stuff. So they were a lovely couple and went into kilt making after World War II and had a kilt business called the Tartan Tailors. And then my dad at the age of 15, 16 went to London and became a master tailor, a tailor and cutting college in London. My first Scottish festival and experience of America was 1983. I was five years old in Atlanta, Georgia at the Stone Mountain Highland Games. And I ended up crying under a table because my mum, dad and my sister, we'd all flown over there not really knowing what to expect. But we were actually the first Scottish company, kilt makers, to come to these events straight from Scotland. Any other company were America-based buying in. So we had a really good price point in the 80s that um, we had queues. Age of five, I was crying under the table, got taken away, it didn't work. But we went to Disney World after we went on a family holiday down to Florida. And it was my sister, it was eight years old, and she'd been given the whole waistcoat and kilt and was selling at eight years old. And she pulled out a wad of dollars. I'm like, where did you get all that money? She's like, while you were crying under the table, I was working. So at six years old, I got a kilt and a waistcoat and all the right stuff, and I got a box to stand on, and they taught me how to use the old credit card machine. And I sold, <laughs> I was the sock department. So I sold the socks at six years old in Atlanta, Georgia, and that's the fourth generation in the industry is how that started. At 18, I made the first 21st century kilt, which is behind you, and it's silver snakeskin hand-sewn PVC. So sewing that kilt was quite therapeutic, and it allowed my mind to imagine kilts in a bigger world, that tartan, the family pattern, plaid, could be irrelevant in the garment, the kilt. So it was about separating tartan and kilts, but a kilt didn't have to be tartan. And that's where it all began in 1996, upstairs in the workshop here. The word kilt dates back to the Vikings, the Danish, um, Norwegian, Scandinavian language. I'll try not to spray this one. Kilte, kilte means to tuck or pleat. And that's where the word kilt came from, that's its origins. And that's all it really means is that the garment is pleated. And that's Hamish, Bob, John, John too, and Bruce. I like to think I'm part of a world movement of unbifurcated clothing for men. The Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, um, Far East Asia, the sarong, um, different formations of skirts for men. Um, I see myself as a part of the evolution of that and the modern movement, but especially in this day and age when, I'm not saying anything goes, but we all need to find ways to find our lives interesting. And Vivian Westwood made a great quote, people who wear unusual clothing have a more interesting life. And me at 45 nearly, I stopped wearing trousers day to day when I was 21 years old. So in 24 years, the fact I've not gone, oh, I can't be bothered with this anymore, I'm going back to trousers, has never happened. The only time was in COVID when we're locked down and I was in my sweatpants a lot. You know, I probably yeah. celebrated my half point in my life wearing a kilt every day in sweatpants, building Lego di dioramas for my son to do stop motion. My mentality is I wear it like it was pre-Jacobite rebellion. In 1745, a kilt was completely outlawed by the English. And if you were caught wearing a kilt in Scotland or tartan, you could be shipped off to the colonies as white slavery. You know, America, Canada, Australia, and you were sent on prison boats. It was an awful time and the kilt and Scottish identity was really being crushed and tried to take it away completely. And then 
48, 50 years later, it got reintroduced to incorporate the Scottish military into the British military and make them have their own identity with the kilt and its uniformity. And then the aristocrats and lords and ladies and clan chiefs kind of jumped on the bandwagon and then it kind of developed as a very regal, formal, fancy dress that 50 years earlier it really was something that farmers, warriors, guys slept in. It was just a big wrap of fabric that went round the body and then it's never really stopped evolving. The kilt can stir certain emotions and make people feel a certain way. Like if you get a group of guys and they're going to the football or the rugby and they're in kilts, they do take on, in a fun sense, a kind of warrior mentality that going to the rugby to support the Scotland team in your kilt, you can't feel really prouder and you want your team to win and you, the kilt is part of that identity. The kilt for me is about comfort, being that bit different, I definitely feel like I've been part of this movement that kilts and skirts for men are more acceptable and it not being in the realms of a transition or sexuality, it's just comfort and the person feels they look good. The fact we've got people bringing in kilts made by my grandfather, by my father, to be repaired and me and John are doing alterations on these 30, 40, 50 year old kilts says that we are sustainable and ethical.